Hello humans, welcome to The Great Everything, the world's only podcast dedicated to art, donuts and transformation. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to devote my existence to culture and philosophy, the greatest self-improvement tools of all. Free speech. Everyone's talking about it. Almost nobody seems to get it. On the right, people hiding behind the term free speech, thinking it allows them to harass and insult whomever they please without consequence. On the left, you see those pointing at the First Amendment, saying that it only regulates a government's authority to censor speech, and because a Twitter mob isn't a government, it doesn't apply. Neither of them understand what the concept of free speech is really for. But I do, because I'm a genius. So today, I'm taking a look at John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty where our current, and in my view, best understanding of freedom of expression comes from. John Stuart Mill was an English philosopher and civil servant responsible for refining many of the ideas that today we consider liberal. A staunch feminist, he was the first member of parliament to legislate for female suffrage, controversially advocating for the equality of the sexes in his essay on the subjection of women arguing that, quote, the legal subordination of one sex to another is wrong in itself and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement, and that it ought to be replaced by a system of perfect equality, admitting no power and privilege on the one side, nor disability on the other. He was a defender of representative democracy. His thoughts on utilitarianism moved morality further away from the grips of religion into the secular domain. And his essay on liberty is, some would say, a definitive statement of the value of freedom for the advancement of human flourishing. So all in all, top guy. I want to start this with a quote. If all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, Mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. On Liberty is, in a sentence, a case for tolerance towards unconventional life choices and unorthodox ideas. Because think of it, whose beliefs and freedoms need most defending, if not those that are threatened or even just frowned upon by society? At the start of the essay, Mill states a guiding principle. This is known as the harm principle. Quote, the object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means used be physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others." End quote. In other words, Mill is saying we should leave people alone unless they're attempting to inflict harm on someone. Okay, so let's stop there and notice a small but significant detail. The principle is intended to regulate, quote, compulsion and control, whether by physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. In the West, we have a rather long tradition of basic freedoms being in some way interfered with, either by despotic emperors like Nero or Domitian, or by a dogmatic church during the Inquisition and before that, or by the institution of slavery and so on. So for much of our history, if you said the wrong thing on the wrong topic, or you were critical of a ruler or an otherwise powerful man, there was a pretty decent chance you'd be harshly punished or even put to death. So of course, liberalism was needed to regulate the intrusion of the church, of the state, of the powerful into the lives and the speech of individuals. That's what Mill is talking about when he says control by legal penalties. The church burning heretics at the stake is a legal penalty. So far, so good. Except, really, today the problem with free speech is kind of different. Because when we feel that certain things can't be said, we're not really worried about getting arrested. What we're worried about is that saying those things will set off social mechanisms and reactions that may have adverse consequences for us. We could get shamed, harassed, marginalized for our views, or even fired. And in some extreme cases, we might even get killed for our views, without any government institution having to intervene at all. That's what Mill means by moral coercion of public opinion. 
Mill didn't have Twitter, but he too was most concerned with this court of public opinion becoming a repressive force, what he called the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling. Those of you who don't come from big cities, you know what that small town mentality is like, right? Where there's a way things are done, and that's how they've always been done, and anything different is looked at with suspicion. Now, I had this all throughout my teenage years. I was an English boy transplanted to Sicily and just dumped there with no preparation, no allies, no cultural knowledge, nothing. I used to joke that in Sicily, if you had the wrong hairstyle that wasn't one of the two or three ones that were most commonly seen, people would stare at you so hard they'd drive their scooters into trees. And at first, that's all it is, right? It's staring, it's that look that's kind of implicitly saying, you don't belong here. And then in these places, it'll usually move on to gossip. And before you know it, there's this dynamic that's set in motion where the you know, normal people will coalesce around their common feeling that you're a little different. And now suddenly there's them and there's you. This is a powerful social force and it can have a severe impact on you. It can, well, effectively cast you out. There's a shift where suddenly you're just not part of the community anymore because of some perceived transgression where it's not like you actually did anything to hurt or offend anyone. Nothing you did really impacted on anyone else in any way. All it was, was just you being different. It's the kind of thing that leads people to suicide. It's a problem because Mill says that when this tyranny of the majority gains the ability to compel and to punish behaviors beyond the ability of the state to do so because, you know, no laws have been broken, then people become scared to express their opinions or act in ways that break the mold, that go against the orthodoxy. They might keep quiet about being atheists or voting Republican or wanting to marry a non-Muslim or they might suppress their sexual preferences all because they're scared of the social consequences in their community. And this becomes a huge limit on the development of individuality, what Mill calls an enslaving of the soul itself. See, Mill believes, and I completely agree, that short of their harming anyone, we must protect the freedom to express themselves and to pursue happiness of those who hold such beliefs that don't fit the norm, that want to live in ways that society might disapprove of. Otherwise, we're just upholding the status quo, and that just results in stagnation, both ideological and social. And this really is the crux of Mill's notion of free speech. It's not just about the freedom to criticize the church or the king or the government. It's about the freedom to formulate, hold and express opinions that are not illegal, but unpopular. We need to defend the right to express unpopular opinions. You know when you see people on Facebook say really fucking boring things just to score social brownie points? I don't care what y'all say. Murder is bad and fuck all y'all who think different. Who do you think could possibly disagree with that? Why are you acting like you're saying something revolutionary? What risk do you think you're taking? You start doing like Amy Schumer and posting stuff like, no means no, and you'll get two billion likes from all your idiot friends who don't want to be conspicuously absent from this yawn fest. Hey, why didn't Brad like my no means no post? Oh my god, is Brad a rapist? No, the opinions we need to protect are the weird ones nobody agrees with, like, you know, black people are made of chocolate, or anyone who likes the show Friends is a cunt. Yeah, those are the opinions we need to see protected, because we know that the poor moron who says them is in for a world of pain. And yes, that includes opinions that are racist, sexist, or generally bigoted. <coughs> Objection. So what, we're supposed to allow bigoted speech now? What happened to we're allowed to use force if it's to prevent harm to others? Isn't racism harm? The critic Jonathan Riley defines harm as, quote, a broad empirical harm, any form of perceptible damage, including physical injury, financial loss, damage to reputation, loss of employment or social position, disappointment of contractual expectations and so forth, but excluding mere dislike or emotional distress without any accompanying evidence of perceptible injury. Why? Well, because of course, if you say you're being harmed, without that perceptible damage element, a damage you can actually point at or somehow quantify, without that, all we have to go on is your word. There's no objective way to assess the harm, or even that there's been harm. And the problem with that is, 
if we're going to go with an always believe the victim policy, well, that means that there's all the incentive for people to make up false harms because people claiming victimhood would have no accountability. I mean, if you want to ruin my life, get me locked up or fired or whatever, all you'd have to do is say that you've been emotionally harmed with no obligation to prove it. Any rule that contemplates a punishment must be devised so as to prevent the system from being abused because there are few things more truly offensive than the idea of innocent people being punished for something they did not do. Fine, so we cleared up the concept harm, but why should we allow terrible ideas to be freely expressed? Well, first of all, I think it's unhelpful to phrase it that way, to focus on Mill wants bad ideas to be expressed. The point is Mill wants all ideas to be expressed. He's not defending bad ideas. He's defending the principle of free expression, including of bad ideas. Here's why it matters. We all agree that to censor an opinion that is right would be absurd and illegitimate. It would deprive society and posterity of something positive, a good idea that might advance humankind in some meaningful way. So, for instance, it was wrong of the church to silence those who said that it was the sun that was at the center of the solar system and the earth went around the sun and not vice versa. But Mill believes that to censor an idea that is wrong is in a way even more dangerous. Consider for a moment what it would mean to censor an opinion because we believe it's wrong. To say that means to say that you know what is right and what is wrong. Who died and made you God? Quote, to refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is false is to assume that their certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. Absolutely brilliant. And of course we are fallible. We are wrong about much of what we are certain of. We, we always have been throughout history. Think of all the things we absolutely 100% believed were true and turned out to be bullshit. Some very, very smart people, smarter than you or me, they believed absolutely that a man walked on water and that Mohammed flew to the moon on a horse. And Marcus Aurelius, one of the kindest, wisest men who ever lived, he believed in persecuting people for their religion. Pretty much everyone believed that slavery was the natural order of things. And until just the other day, even gay people believed being gay was a sin. As Mill points out, every age has held many opinions which subsequent ages have deemed not only false, but absurd. Why should we think we're any better? Objection. Wait a minute. Okay, I get that we're fallible. But what, now I'm not allowed to make rules or set out punishments because I could be mistaken? Should we never act on our opinions because those opinions might be wrong? If we did that, we'd just be paralyzed by indecision. Nothing would ever get done. Well, Mill responds to this objection with a fantastic quote about how we can claim to have knowledge. There is the greatest difference between presuming an opinion to be true because, with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted, and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. By God, that's so good I want to read it out again. There is the greatest difference between presuming an opinion to be true because, with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted, and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. According to Mill, this is how we can claim knowledge. Quote, Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is the very condition which justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action, and on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. What Mill is saying that the only way we can be justified in holding our opinion true and then acting on it is by that opinion surviving the assault of all possible objections, and at the end of it your opinion is like, I'm still standing. You listen to the objection and you refute the objection. Then you can say that your opinion is, for the time being, right or at least more right than the objection. You can't just start by claiming that you're right and then insulate your opinion from any future objection. That's what the church would do. They'd just call anything that disagreed with them blasphemy. They'd call heretic. They'd burn it at the stake so the opinion didn't actually have to be encountered or engaged with. And by the way, that's what we do now on Twitter when instead of engaging with an opposing view, we just shame the person holding it as a Nazi or a slut or a traitor or an Uncle Tom or an apologist or a misogynist. That's our modern equivalent of calling dissenters heretics. So much easier than actually engaging with the opinion and taking it apart. But engaging with it is what we should do.
We can't ever be 100% certain that our beliefs are true. What we can do is issue, quote, a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. If the challenge is not accepted or is accepted and the challenger fails to refute us, then we still won't be certain, but we'll have done our best and Mill says we'll know we'll have done everything to give truth a chance to reach us. So that's the big takeaway from this section of On Liberty. We need bad opinions. Bad opinions are the only way we know which ideas are actually good. By testing them against the bad ideas, because through that dialectic, the good idea comes out stronger. You don't just believe that idea blindly, you understand why that idea is better. Good arguments need constant training, and the opponents of those ideas are the ideal sparring partners. We should constantly be testing our beliefs and notions like Socrates would do. He'd just be asking why, thinking of counterexamples, and then figuring out why those don't disprove the general theory. And when they do disprove the theory, when your original opinion was wrong, then you change your opinion. You take the new info on board. So now your opinion is much more nuanced, it's stronger, it's better. And even when your opinion is true, quote, if it is not fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed, it will be held as a dead dogma, not a living truth. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Great Everything. And if you like the show, there's a few ways you can help out. You can leave a review on iTunes or anywhere else you listen to this podcast. Or you can share it, embed it, talk about it on your podcast or write a blog about it. Or you could just add me on the various Twitters and Instagrams out there. But if you want to be a part of the conversation, you can call in using Anchor. Or you can look up The Great Everything on Facebook. I have a discussion group there where people talk about literally everything, from ethics to politics to Marvel movies. So if that's your thing, check it out. I hope I see you again here, there, or anywhere else, frankly. Until then, grazie e arrivederci. Well, arrivederci, Luigi. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.